What's up guys and welcome to One Take. I'm Gil and today we're talking about Raised by Wolves episodes one through three, all of which have been released on HBO Max. This video will of course be full of spoilers for all three of those episodes. If you haven't watched them yet and still wanna hear my thoughts, check out the link in the description or in the card above for my spoiler free review. For the rest of you, let's get into it. First, some overall thoughts. I was pretty blown away by this show, especially episodes one and two, which were directed by Ridley Scott. Besides the fact that the show just looks and sounds incredible, the things that draw me in are one, you can tell that they put a lot of thought into the world this series takes place in. So when you watch the episodes, there's a lot of discovery that happens. And I love learning about the Mithraic culture. I love seeing more and more of the history that brought humanity to this point. That's one of the things that gets me excited to keep watching. There's also just the intellectual curiosity of watching this grand experiment play out. What happens when you give a bunch of children to androids and ask those androids to raise the kids, force the belief system on them? How does that go? On top of that, you have the growing conflict between humans and androids, believers and non-believers. So if I just sum up in one word what continuously draws me into this show, it would be curiosity. Now specifically, that's curiosity to learn about the world and see how the story progresses. But the one part of the show that I'm a little uncertain about right now is the characters, especially in episode three when we start to spend more time with the Mithraics and when the momentum sort of slows down. A lot happens in episode one and two. Things start to slow down a little bit in episode three, and that's where focus really shifts to character. And at that point, I felt like there were a few plot contrivances in how the characters act. And so far, I'm just not super interested in any of the characters besides mother, father, and Campion. Though I still thought episode three was solid, big fan of episodes one and two, so overall I feel pretty good and optimistic about this series. To quote Mother in episode one, I feel optimistic. Anyway, with that, let's jump into the details, but first, just a quick reminder, if you're enjoying these videos, to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video. You're especially gonna wanna do that if you're enjoying Raised by Wolves, because I'll be doing these detailed breakdowns for every episode, so definitely make sure you're subscribed. First, I just wanna talk about how quickly things moved and escalated in episode one. You have mother and father crash land on the planet, birth six children, then as the children grow, one of them, Tali, dies by falling into a pit. Then four more die from sickness, which we'll later learn is radiation poisoning. Father wants to give Campion to the Mithraic, so mother kills father. Then the episode ends with mother infiltrating the Ark, popping a bunch of people, and then crashing it. Now, to my knowledge, that arc is literally the last of humanity. Besides the children that mother and father are raising, the only other living humans that escaped Earth are on that arc. So when mother destroys it, she's dealing a potentially lethal blow to humanity's ability to continue its very existence. And it was all treated pretty casually. It didn't feel like a monumental event in the episode. And I liked that. From mother's point of view, this isn't a big deal. There is a threat coming, a threat to her children. So she goes into the ship and takes it out. That felt a little unsettling to me because the show is presenting a sort of clinical breakdown of humanity's potential extermination but it's treated so casually. So that felt unsettling, and I thought that was very effective. On the other hand, I will say that one aspect of the show which most underwhelmed me would be the Mithraic human characters. And this is one example of that. We see them later, and I would expect them to have much more of a reaction to their arc being taken down. And sure, they're not happy about it, but I haven't really seen a grieving process. I haven't really seen them deal with the fact that humanity may not survive. Maybe that'll make more sense as the series goes on. We don't know too much about the Mithraic culture, so perhaps they are trained mentally to deal with this, and this is actually a natural reaction for them. Now, we of course have to talk about Mother. I love the Mother character. She has such an odd way of speaking. Every time she smiles, it just looks a little bit off. And it was pretty hilarious just how bad a job she did trying to convince Marcus and his crew in episode one that she's human. She treats them to dinner. She keeps politely asking them to leave, 
Cut to the very next scene, Mark is telling his group she's definitely an android. One of the interesting aspects of both mother and father is that neither of them seem fully aware of their nature or their abilities. For example, we see mother learn that she has the ability to mimic someone's face. We see her learn that she can go into that crazy bronze attack mode and start exploding people. Now, in episodes two and three, we come to find out that she's what's called a necromancer, which is a type of android that generally belongs to the Mithraics, but according to Marcus, the atheists must have captured her and reprogrammed her. If she was reprogrammed, that may explain why she doesn't fully understand her nature. She has this foreign programming in her mind that is maybe what is running her on a day to day, and she's not fully aware of what's beneath the surface in her true necromancer nature. Now you have to wonder if she is a necromancer, she is a war machine capable of doing incredible damage as we've seen, if she's a war machine, just with some extra code added in telling her to be a mother and take care of these children, you've got to wonder how strong that code is. Will it be able to hold and will it be able to fully suppress her nature? We've seen glimpses of how dangerous she can be and I've got to think that's going to be a pretty big source of tension over the next seven episodes. Let's talk about Father. I am such a fan of his character. He adds a lot of levity to this show, which could easily be a very dark and dour experience. His propensity for telling jokes was hilarious and is a gimmick that could easily be overused, but I thought it was used just the right amount. My favorite moment with him, I think, is when we literally see him inventing jokes. He's pacing around at night, thinks up a joke and says to himself, that's a good one, I'll save that for the little one. He comes off as a kind of tragic figure to me. As Campion becomes more and more cynical and starts to tell mother and father that he knows their feelings are fake, he no longer believes that they truly care for him, it's really just what they were programmed to do and how they were programmed to act, but at one point you hear father assure Campion, I am real Campion. And in that moment, and others like it, I see somebody really genuinely wanting to do good, but he might not be capable of it. As androids, mother and father may not be capable of giving Campion the true care that he's looking for. And all of this makes me wonder, what is the nature of these androids? Are they capable of emotion? Is there something different or special about mother and father versus the other androids we meet? On the surface, they definitely seem different. I think we meet about three androids from the Mithraic between these three episodes, and none of them come close to what we see from mother and father. None of them really attempt to display the emotions that we see from our androids. And at the end of episode three, when the children are looking for the Ark, Tempest is clearly starting to show some belief in Mother. She comments how it seemed like she really cared about the children, and she's never seen an android act like that before. So it could be as simple as Mother and Father were just programmed to mimic love and mimic emotion, do their best to be human. But I wonder if there's more to it than that. Are they conscious? Are they as conscious as human beings are? I've got to think that's one of the themes we'll be exploring in the next seven episodes. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Campion, but first, one more thought on mother and father. It's really interesting that they're even capable of having conflicting thoughts with one another. It definitely makes the show more interesting that mother and father pretty quickly are out of sync. But on the surface, it seems odd that their programming would even allow allow them to be at odds with one another. And I have to wonder if maybe that was intentional. Perhaps their creator realized that the ideal scenario for the children that these androids will be raising, the ideal scenario is that mother and father have to sort of counterbalance each other. So I think that goes along with the general theme of how much of what we see from mother and father is pure programming, how much of it is something more complicated than that, a sort of emergent consciousness that allows them to, in some ways, go against their programming, all of that is super interesting, and I love that that's just one of the many ideas we're dealing with on this show. So going to Campion, I find his character pretty interesting, and I'm enjoying the developments we've seen so far. After watching all of his friends die, he starts to see how Mother failed them, failed to protect them. And he cares for Mother, but he understands Father's plan to ultimately hand him over to the Mithraic. When Mother goes against them on that, Campion starts to see Mother as their enemy, and that is further accelerated 
when he sees Mother's destructive capabilities. So I think by the time the new kids show up, the ones that Mother brought from the Ark, at that point, Campion was already starting to not really trust Mother, so he was primed to instead place his trust in these children. One moment I found interesting when Campion is first interacting with the other children is when Hunter asks Paul, Marcus's kid, to hand his mouse over to Campion. Why was Hunter asking Paul to give his mouse over? I think that was to create a sense of reciprocity. Give Campion the mouse, and then he'll feel sort of in debt to us, and it'll just accelerate the process of winning over Campion's trust. And it seems to work. He pretty quickly aligns with the children against Mother. One thing we've seen shades of, and I'm waiting to see more of it, is that Campion was essentially raised by wolves. If you look at the title of the show, Campion is raised by these androids, so you wouldn't expect expect him to be entirely human in his behavior. And we do see a couple of small differences in his behavior. He doesn't pick up on sarcasm. He's a bit more resourceful. He's the one who's leading them to go find the Ark. But I'm waiting to see more significant differences. When you see how odd Mother behaves, you've got to think that'll create some bizarre emotional differences in Campion versus children that were raised by humans. But that's something I'm waiting to see. There are also a couple of sort of mysteries around Campion. One, why didn't he succumb to the radiation the way the rest of the children did? And two, is he the subject of this prophecy that the Mithraic talk about? An orphan boy in an empty land will lead the Mithraic to a place where a city of peace will be built. So there's that prophecy, and there's the question of why did Campion survive the radiation poisoning? So let's talk about the radiation first. As a quick recap, basically mother, father, and the children pick what they call carbos from the vegetation on the planet. They kind of look like giant potatoes, but they have a pit on the inside. They use the carbos for food and they use it for fuel. Mother and father tested them and saw no radiation, no issues with eating them, but they never tested the pit. And apparently the pit is radioactive. When you pick the carbos, the pit starts to decompose and poison the rest of the tuber with radiation. So unknowingly, the children were consuming these radiation infested carbos for years and that's what ultimately killed them. So what's so special about Campion? Why didn't he succumb? It seems like he has some natural immunity to the radiation. And the only theory I have so far is that when mother gives birth to the six children or pulls them out of their little birthing boxes, Campion stops breathing. She brings Campion to her chest, hums, and then Campion miraculously starts breathing again. Now, mother doesn't know what all of her capabilities are. So is it possible that that humming and bringing Campion to her chest had a physical effect on him? Did it truly save him in the moment and potentially give him another gift, give him some sort of immunity that protects him from the radiation poisoning? In episode one, Campion provides some narration and he says something along the lines of this side of mother, this dangerous side of her has always been a part of her and maybe something like it is a part of me too. That makes me wonder if when Mother saved his life as a baby and she gave him this immunity to radiation poisoning, who knows what else she gave him? Has she physically modified Campion in some strange way that we'll learn about over the rest of the season? Now let's talk about the prophecy for a second. It seems that in the Mithraic religion, they have a prophecy about an orphan boy in an empty land finding a place where they're going to build a city of peace. Before Mother slaughters Marcus's friends and Marcus's group, they thought that Campion might be the subject of that prophecy. They've referenced it twice now, so I have to think it's going to be an important part of the story. My question is, will it simply be a guiding force for Marcus and his group, where they try to find whoever is the subject of this prophecy? Maybe some of them think it's Campion, so they try to kidnap him from Mother, and that sparks the sort of religious war? Or could the show truly delve into some mystical elements? I doubt it. It seems like it's pretty focused on hard sci-fi so far, but it's too early to say for sure. Maybe over the next few episodes, we'll be debating over who is the orphan in this prophecy, just like when we all watched Game of Thrones, we wondered who the true Azor Ahai is. Now, we've got to talk about the creatures that show up in the second episode. They look so interesting, almost lizard-like, but then when you have a glimpse at their face, those look almost humanoid, but 
pointier. They're also one of the interesting mysteries about this show. Where did these creatures come from? And why haven't they shown themselves for 12 years? They never attacked the Gen 1 children. They only showed up after Mother brought the new kids from the Ark. I wonder if it could have something to do with the strange weather patterns on the planet. It snows every night. We get many shots of those crazy rolling clouds. So who knows what the weather is like on the rest of the planet? Maybe they were in hibernation. Maybe every certain number of years they go away and they come back. Now I have a feeling there's more than meets the eye to these creatures and there's going to be some kind of a twist. Going into fan theory, total speculation mode, I wonder if maybe Mother somehow spawned those creatures. With the threat of those creatures out there, the children are now more dependent on her. And by protecting them from the monsters, that helps her gain their trust. We see that explicitly with Tempest. By the end of the third episode, after seeing Mother protect her from the creature, Tempest is starting to wonder if maybe Mother truly does care. Now on the surface, it seems like Mother is as surprised as everybody else to see these creatures manifest themselves. But we know that Mother doesn't understand her true nature entirely, and a number of references are made to maybe Mother's killing the children without even realizing it. Now it turned out they were wrong. She was not poisoning the kids, it was the Carbos. But maybe she does have some ability to create these monsters, and she did it subconsciously as a way of creating a threat which she can protect the children from and ultimately gain their trust. I will say, when you hear Mother referred to as a necromancer, that usually refers to somebody with magic abilities to raise the dead or bring back their spirits. So perhaps Mother can summon these creatures. Maybe she's taking dead bodies from the Ark and turning them into these monsters. Anyway, I might be going too far into speculation territory now, but I just have a gut feeling there's some kind of a twist there and it has something to do with Mother. Now let's talk about Marcus. I loved the casual reveal in episode two that Marcus and Sue are imposters. They're atheists who, during the war, found a medic robot and find records of the real Marcus and Sue who are scheduled to get on the Ark and escape the soon-to-be-destroyed planet Earth. First off, that medic android was awesome. He was the perfect mix of creepy and hilarious. I am curious why he so readily agreed to perform plastic surgery on these imposters to turn them in to Marcus and Sue, but either way, he performs the plastic surgery. The imposters look exactly like Marcus and Sue after that, and then they kill their original counterparts taking their place on the Ark. Immediately, these two characters get more interesting, and on top of everything else, now we have two atheists as prominent members of the Mithraic group. So there are some pretty interesting ways they can go with this. We already see Marcus getting a foothold as a sort of leader in the group. As he rises up the ranks, is it possible that others will find out truly he's an atheist? And what kind of crisis of faith will that create for others in the group? On the other hand, we know Marcus didn't exactly choose the culture he grew up in. We saw that as a child, he was forced to fight in a war. So perhaps now, embedding himself in the Mithraic culture, he will start to question his belief or his lack of belief and start to have an appreciation for the religion he's now pretending to be a part of. Or maybe his wife Sue starts to question things and will have some conflict between the two of them, where one wants to remain loyal to the atheists and the other one wants to truly become a part of this religion. So I mentioned up front that I was a little bit worried about will they be able to keep the characters interesting? This is one avenue that if it's explored properly, that would definitely suck me in. I'm a little worried about whether or not they'll be able to pull that off because episode three does start to shift focus to the Mithraic. And a lot of what we saw, to be honest, didn't really work for me. First, you have Marcus and Sue finding out they have this child, Paul. And that should be a pretty big struggle for them. They didn't have a kid, all of a sudden they have a kid. Sue does say up front, I can't be a mother. But we don't really spend a whole lot of time in that mode. We essentially flash forward 13 years to where now she treats Paul as her own son and she cares for him like a son that she truly has love for. So it was pretty jarring to go from I can't be a mother to I am now a loving and caring mother. I would have just liked to have seen a little bit of the transition there. I also would have expected, like I said earlier, to see more of a reaction from the Mithraic to the destruction of the Ark. They may have just watched humanity essentially go extinct 
And so far, it doesn't really seem to be bothering anybody. And lastly, there's the conflict between Marcus and the guy in charge. I'm not really finding any of that too interesting, especially when it keeps cutting away from the mother-father storyline, which I find much more compelling. So as we learn more about the Mithraic culture, maybe that'll explain their behavior better, maybe it'll give me more of an appreciation for what we're seeing, but for right now, that's the part of the show that probably interests me least. Let's talk about the kids that Mother brings back from the Ark. Basically, Mother and Father try to save humanity, take two. One question I have about these kids is they were living in a sim while they were in high hibernation for about 13 years. They said time works a little bit differently, so I wonder, did they truly experience 13 years of time? If so, these kids are in a pretty interesting position. That essentially means they have the minds of 20 to 30 year olds, but they're just trapped in the bodies of five to 15 year olds. One aspect of the group I'm also intrigued by is I think we're setting up to have some conflict between the children in terms of their differing faiths. Hunter is very clearly a devout person and very anti mother. On the other hand, I mentioned it a couple of times, but Tempest seems like she's starting to turn around and maybe begin to believe in mother. So I have a feeling we're going to start to see some split alliances where some are with mother and some are against her. All of that's made more complicated by the fact that to some degree, they will be reliant on mother and father to protect them, especially with these monsters running around. Finally, let's talk about that weird cliffhanger at the end of episode three. Basically, the children are on their way to find the Ark so they can leave mother and father. On their way there, Paul, Marcus and Sue's kid, gets separated from the rest of the children. He finds a stick doll, then he sees a hooded figure that sort of summons him. He follows and then falls into a pit and lands on a branch that saves his life. Now it seems like the hooded figure did that on purpose, tried to get him to fall into the trap, but who is this hooded figure? So when the hooded figure first appears, we hear something that should sound familiar. Way back in episode one, when Tali was playing with the doll and humming a nursery rhyme to herself before presumably falling into the pit, we hear her humming that nursery rhyme again when we see the hooded figure. Now, think back to episode one. We never saw Tally's body, so we can't say with 100% certainty that she fell into the pit. It sounds a little ridiculous, but by process of elimination, it's hard to imagine who else it could be. The other children all succumbed to the radiation poisoning, so there were bodies to account for them. We know it can't be mother or father because we know where they are when this hooded figure appears, and it seems unlikely that it's associated with the Mithraic because they consistently wear that white Mithraic garb. So I think it's Tali, and I think about the title Raised by Wolves. On the surface, we assume that refers to Campion and the other children being raised by mother and father. Maybe there's a second meaning to that. Maybe someone or something on this planet raised Tali and she has also been raised by wolves. Going back into crazy fan theory mode for a second, maybe those creatures that attacked Tempest and have shown up a couple of times are more intelligent than we realize and Tali was raised not by wolves, but by weird lizard humanoid things. In any case, that was a pretty surprising cliffhanger. Felt kind of like it came out of nowhere, so hopefully it has a pretty good payoff. Last thing I wanted to mention, up front I said there were a few plot contrivances, mostly in episode three, that didn't quite work for me and I wanted to mention them here. First, I'll mention one that actually occurred in episode one, Mother kills the group that's with Marcus. She goes up to the Ark and indiscriminately kills a bunch of humans, crashes the Ark. But if we rewind for a second, before she flew up to the Ark, she gets face to face with Marcus. And instead of killing him, she smashes his head and throws him out of the vessel. At first, I thought this was a plot convenience. They needed to keep Marcus alive. But I think there's a chance that there's something more to it. Maybe Mother somehow knows that Marcus is truly an atheist pretending to be a Mithraic. Or maybe Mother and Marcus have some sort of a past together that he doesn't remember. Maybe she doesn't even consciously remember it. So 
perhaps something built into her programming or into her subconscious stopped her from killing Marcus. So I'm curious when they're going to pick up on that plot thread. Fast forwarding to episode three, Mother flies over to the Ark to look for omnibiotics that she can use to help cure the children. When Mother arrives, she's already screaming and kind of gives her position away to the humans, which gives them a chance to hide underground and protect themselves from her. I found that kind of odd because Mother could have just strolled in and from what we've seen of her destructive capabilities, if she came across any of the Mithraic, she could have very easily taken them out. So I'm not sure why she came in screaming, giving away her position. Speaking of which, once the humans get underground, they seem to be pretty safe, but then they send up an android, which Mother, of course, kills very quickly, and that seemed like a really poor decision. If you're hiding underground and you send out an android, that's a pretty big risk that you're going to give away your position. But they are setting up the guy in charge as maybe not the smartest and not the most effective leader, so that one I can chalk up to intentionally poor decision making. Another one in episode three, when Campion and the children make a run for the Ark, the way they get themselves some time is Campion brings Father into one of the stone structures and then traps him inside with a wooden board. Now, of course, Father can easily break out. He can easily break that door down. But instead of doing that, he waits, he yells, he yells, he threatens to break it down. When he finally does, the kids are gone. So again, that just felt a little silly to me. When you know how dangerous it is for these children to leave the area, when you know how angry mother will be if she finds out you let the kids go, you punch your way out of that door immediately. You don't wait for Campion to have a change of heart and let you out. I also found it a little silly that mother and father tested the carbos for radiation poisoning, but never checked the pits. And the last one is that when mother is trying to find Paul and she's just shouting for him, you don't need to be afraid. If you're out there, I want you to scream as loud as you can. We've seen that mother has the ability to mimic other people's voices. So it seems to me the best course of action would have been to just mimic one of the other children and call for Paul, then he immediately would have come running. So none of these are major complaints. I recognize that it's sort of nitpicking, but it just worries me a little bit that most of those complaints I have are about episode three. So it feels a little bit like they put a lot into the first two episodes. They got Ridley Scott. They made those episodes fantastic. And I just hope that the things that didn't quite work for me in episode three don't continue for the remainder of the season because if they can maintain the quality from the first couple of episodes I could easily see this becoming just an incredible sci-fi series so those minor grievances aside I was a pretty big fan of these first few episodes and I can't wait to see where it goes next so I'll wrap up by saying if you enjoyed this video please go ahead and hit the like button hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video Anyway, let me know in the comments how you felt about these episodes, what worked for you, what didn't work, and what are you excited to see in the rest of the season. Let me know in the comments and we'll keep the conversation going. With that, thanks for watching and see you on the next One Take.